Hey folks! Okay, well, now we've gone through, we've looked at tokenizing our code, scanning our code, we've looked at parsing our code, we've looked at different techniques for doing context-sensitive analysis, right, making sure that things have been declared before they're used, doing all the type checking, that kind of an idea. What I want to get into next is looking at how we might represent a program internally in the time frame between when we've read it in and parsed it and the time when we eventually produce whatever it is we're producing as our final output. So you've got all these kind of intermediate levels of representation where you've got all of the data about a particular program stored internally somewhere and you're manipulating it, you're optimizing it, you're rearranging it, you're figuring out how to transform that into your target language, but you've got the, this internal representation somehow. And so what we want to take a look at this week are different ways that we can come up, different representations we can come up with for that intermediate um, storage of the program, if you like, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of different approaches, and just some of the different ideas behind it and how we might actually implement some of these. So that's the plan for this week. For this particular session, I'm just going to give kind of a summary of things, and then we'll get into the gory details in the next couple. All right, so most of the work that the compiler does takes place after you've come up with some sort of an internal representation, right? You've gone through, you've done your scanning, you've done your parsing, and you've got, you, you've got this collection of information about the program that you need to store, and then start doing your analysis, your transformations, your optimizations, your translations. And you might actually go through a whole sequence of different internal representations of the program over the course of time right before you produce whatever the final result is going to be. So we need these internal representations somehow to be efficient to produce. We don't want it to be insanely slow to produce these things during the compilation process. We want it to be easy to go through and traverse them, to search them, to manipulate them, to work with them. Right? So we want something that we can work with effectively. But it also needs to be something that can effectively model the the concepts, the ideas that are represented in the original source code and that we want to represent in the target language. So in particular, we're going to look at syntax trees or syntax graphs, and we're going to look at linear codes, two of the most common representation styles, and see what we can do with those. So the idea is that, so here we'll take a look at a linear code approach, a tree approach, and a graph approach to representing just a simple expression. So we've got this expression in our source language that, you know, x is assigned z plus y times y minus z, and let's say we're using our usual associativity and precedence rules, so it's going to do the, the multiplication first, and then the addition, and then the subtraction. So if we were looking at this in the the context of a syntax tree, we'd say, okay, well, we've got an assignment where the left-hand side is an x and the right-hand side is this expression. And for that one, again, the, the last operation, the one highest in the tree is going to be subtraction. It's going to have the z over on the left and the addition. Um, it's going to have this z plus and then the y times y over on the right side of it. And again, it's going to do the, the plus last. So we've got that highest in the tree. It's adding the z to the result of the product of y and y. So we've got this syntax tree representing the expression. And again, this is kind of an, ab an abstract idea of the parse trees that we would have come up with as we were going through and parsing our code. Now, one of the things about the syntax tree is it does give a very good representation of what the original expression looked like, but We've got a lot of kind of duplicate nodes in here. We've got Z here twice. We've got Y here twice. If those things aren't changing, there's no reason why they have, why we'd have to have two separate nodes for this. We could have one node for Z and just have both of these refer to it. So when we're talking about syntax graphs, that'll usually be the, the big distinguishing feature is that if there are shared nodes, then everybody that uses that node just points to it. Right. So it's, uh, um, again, not a pure tree anymore, but we've got much of the same information. And so we'll take a look at syntax graphs and how to produce them, how to figure out when you've got common subtrees. Um, obviously, syntax trees we can produce as an abstracted or simpler form of our parse trees. 
And then the other completely different representation, right? These give a very effective idea of what the original expression looked like, right? What the original source code was saying. An alternative is since we're often targeting some kind of assembly language uh, as our output, right? If, if we're compiling, then typically we're compiling to assembly language, but even if we're not, then we can use an assembly-like syntax as this kind of intermediate representation. So the idea for linear codes is that we provide a bunch of different operations that each take you know, a fixed number of operands and store a result somewhere. And so if we were going, and these are all just very simple operations, so an addition or a multiplication or a subtraction. And so we'll use a bunch of temporary storage locations and just apply the sequence of steps that we would for this to figure out the values as we go. So this would kind of work from the, the bottom of the tree up where we say, okay, let's store Y, or pardon me, um, store, I guess we don't really need to store X here. We'll store Y in a register or a temporary variable. We can store Z in a temporary variable. And then we can go through and say, okay, well, let's take the product of whatever, you know, our where we store Y was in R1. So we'll take the product of R1 times R1 and we'll store that in a temporary variable. So now we've got the result of this subtree in a temporary variable. And we'll use that Right, the result for the from that temporary or from that subtree in R3 and add it with the Z that we had stored in our other temporary variable R2. And so we'll get the result of this subtree and store it in a temporary location. So let's say R4. I'm just making up names here, but so we have these temporary variables, if you like, that are being used to store the results of subtrees. Right, another one for this one where we're saying, okay, you know, take our, our Z and whatever came out of our subtree here and you know subtract the Z from that. So we get our R4 minus R2 and store it in another temporary variable. And then eventually store the result of that in our variable X. So the linear code approach is to take essentially like a bottom-up evaluation of our syntax tree and every place where we've got an internal node we store the result in a temporary variable someplace so that we can use it as we work our way further up the tree. So we've got these three very different approaches to how we'll model an, a representation of whatever that original program was doing. So again, the syntax trees are nice and intuitive, a natural representation in terms of what the original source code looked like. Um, the linear codes are a good representation to target sort of an eventual assembly language. With the syntax trees, there's actually a whole variety of other kind of graphical representations that we can look at. So the syntax trees and syntax graphs. But we'll also look at graphical representations for representing the flow of control within a program, right? When you jump backward and forward across instructions because of an if or because of a loop or because of a function call. Uh, we'll look at dependency graphs where you say, okay, well, let's keep track of which things have been declared and which other ones depend on those. Uh, we'll look at call graphs that just model the, the potential function calls and returns in a program. So lots of different graphical representations that are used for different things. And again, this is where the idea comes in that, that we might use different internal representations at different points in the compilation process. And again, with the linear codes, there's a variety of different linear codes out there. We'll look at just a couple. Uh, we'll talk about one address codes and three address codes and see how they go. But again, we'll just look at how these things can be used, how they can be implemented, and what some of the implications are. So we'll look at combinations of the representations at different points over time. So in particular, we'll take a look at using a combination of linear codes and control flow graphs. Uh, we'll look at decisions that we have to make in terms of how to optimize the size of the data structures that we're creating for this representation, uh, the speed of them in terms of searching and traversing them, uh, how usable they are, how effective they are, how intuitive they are. And then we'll start getting into some follow-on issues in terms of what kind of an underlying memory model do we want to use uh, what kind of naming approach do we want to use for the variables and temporary variables that we're working with? Um, we'll take a look at some of the potential that we have for 
subsequently rearranging chunks of the code or for performing different optimizations. So these are all things that we want to take a look at over the course of the next week or so. All right, I will leave the intro there for now. Um, next time we'll get into syntax trees and syntax graphs in a bit more detail.